we are back. Bluegrass Soccer Cast, your home for all things soccer right here in, <coughs> oh, <no. laughs> in the beautiful Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, God, it's live. I can't edit that out. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jimmy, your coughing host for tonight. Uh, this, of course, is Mr. John. John, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jimmy. How are you? I'm good, my friend. And today we have our first major guest of the season. Um, he is the new head coach of Lexington Supporting Club, Mr. Darren Powell. Darren, welcome to the show, sir. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Hope you both are doing well as well and that cough clears up. Um, but glad to be here and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, a little bit of behind the scenes. I took a giant sip right before I started talking and that was not a good idea. <laughs> um, so, coach, but you know, Welcome to Kentucky. Welcome to Lexington. Uh, hopefully, so far, it's been a really good experience in the city. Yeah, no, everyone's been super welcoming and you know, really enjoying my time in Lexington so far and trying to explore it. Probably not. Um, the weather hasn't been as kind to explore as <laughs> I probably would have liked, maybe coming in the summer. But um, yeah, so far, so good. But the people, uh, like any anything, people make um, you know your time you know, worthwhile and, and everybody in Lexington so far has been so welcoming and it's been a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Have you uh, de developed any spots like coffee shop, a, a bagel shop possibly? I've been a couple of times and I took my wife the other week to old, is it old school coffee shop? Um, mm -hmm. Just on downtown, which has been kind of a cool spot to go on a Sunday and review the week and return a few emails uh, in, in there. So I've enjoyed that that spot so far yeah that's a pretty good one uh, if you get a chance chocolate holler another good one uh, i think they're staying open i know they were looking to close for a while but that's another cute little coffee shop near the university okay all right i'll take i'll get those recommendations i'm always looking for those so well and i'm sure the club's main coffee sponsor doesn't love hearing the head coach saying <laughs> he's going somewhere else yeah, I, who's the I, official I, coffee sponsor john uh, badass oh yeah you know they sponsor the w league team that's right and i've been a few times to badass as well so it's it's pretty local to where i'm staying so yeah bad, badass copies badass. <laughs> <laughs> well i was about to say based on where you all train it's kind of out of the way so i could just, like i could give you all a pass there but if you're near the, one of the locations I've been a few times to one of the locations, so yeah. But Sunday mornings when I'm just relaxing, I just take take a new um, new location, so I'm out of the way. This may be the best start to a show ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's already going to get me in trouble. <laughs> Ooh, sorry about that. Um, before we get too far down the road, uh, talking about Lexington and your upcoming season and everything. I do have to pull things back just a couple of months when you were with the Inter Miami FC um, and your time down there, Coach. What was that like, especially when Messi came on board um, to help you know bring the fans in more? What kind of things did you learn from that time? No, just a, an amazing experience, and and my time at Inter Miami was was you know very very good in terms of. You know, each year I kind of did different things as well. So my job was uh, very motivating and you always have a lot of energy. So when I first came in, I was actually um, coming in and was assistant coach to Jason Christ with the um, Fort Lauderdale team that was going to play in the USL in, in 2020, the COVID year. And then part of that role was to be the head coach, obviously, um, when he went with the, the full national team and uh, the U23 team at the time. And so then to see, but also alongside that was being the academy director. So it was kind of two roles and, and, and two different positions and obviously bringing those young players through. Then being the head coach of the second team for two years in two different leagues. And fast forward, all these young players coming through. And then, you know, the last year being with the first team was an amazing experience being in all those, you know, the first team venues and um, help coaching those players, the young ones transitioning from MLS2 to the first team, alongside obviously the full-time pros. So amazing experience and, you know, one of the, the proudest parts of, of that whole journey was we played DC United in July and tied 2-2 two -two 
and six of the guys that we've been able to debut at MLS 2 and, and with the academy were able to play that night, two of which actually scored two of our goals. Um, and even David Ruiz, um, who's doing phenomenally well right now, he managed to score a goal that was uh, VAR. So I was disappointed with VAR, VAR in that particular moment, but it was the right decision. But that would have been really nice if that was the winning goal and, and three academy boys had, uh, had contributed in that game. So then Messi came in and my role went back to director of player development. Um, uh, but just to see the, the level of professionalism and, and the level of detail um, that those players have for Inter Miami was just amazing. And just the way they applied themselves, helped the young players. And obviously everyone saw the boost that they gave the team, um, you know, during the Liga's Cups and that run, which was phenomenal. And to see that firsthand and be around that every single day, not necessarily in, you know, I was not, you know, on the field with those players, but just watching from afar and, and, and helping shape some of the new crop that were going to come through with Inter Miami was particularly special. And so, yeah, it was it, it was an amazing experience. And, you know, at the end of the season, the time was right, maybe to look for a new experience for myself personally. And um, the opportunity with Lexington was something that I felt we can recreate a really special project here. And, you know, with the ownership, uh, the investment that they're putting into to not only um, the first team and the women's team, but into, you know, Lexington soccer in general, creating an academy and creating the youth programs below the first team. It was a massive project and something that I'm extremely excited to be at. Uh, yeah. yeah, did you, how did that pitch by the ownership or and by uh, Stockley, uh, how was that pitched? Like what part of it did really brought you in, like grabbed you, it was like, oh, I kinda wanna come to Lexington. No, I think, you know, for me and, and what I've been able to do with my career as a coach, it's always been looking at not only um, you know, establishing, you know, programs and pathways. I think that's been really, really important to me because when I first came to the country, you know, in 1991 and then started coaching, you know, even when I was a student and still playing, you know, coaching, what I found was a lot of players were, were being asked, especially the top players, were being asked to play for several different teams and getting pulled in so many different directions. And the players always just want to please. They want to play, they want to please. So if they've got a high school coach asking them to play on a Saturday, the club coach is asking them to play on a Saturday, the ODP coach is asking them to play on a Saturday, they want to say yes to all three, and all three are good um, experiences. Uh, but as a player, how do you navigate that landscape to know what is best for you in your career? And, and, and also the careers at that time didn't really have an end goal like now the MLS certainly does, and now that's filtering down into the USL. So for me, it's creating pathways for players and making it, you know, something that young players in the community can aspire to, to be. Is okay, I want to be a professional player in my hometown. That can be my first port of call. So in Orlando, we put that in place. In San Antonio, into Miami, and you know, they're they're big player markets, big populations. So for me, part of the challenge is okay. We want to do really well at the first team level and that's where our focus is and that's what my day-to-day -day is but also there's a bigger project here um uh you know for for the ownership they want to really put lexington soccer on the map and have you know pathways for lexington children boys and girls um simultaneously where they don't have to necessarily move to a different market to get the desire and the pathway to go to a professional team so that was part of the the, the, the long-term vision of the project that, that super excited me. Obviously, I'm on, on the day-to-day -day in, the, in the short term and making sure the first team is ready, but also very conscious of the fact that, you know, the first team players are, are role models for the young players and, you know, bringing players from Lexington through a system that is in its infancy. And from my, my experiences, are we able to replicate some of the things that we're able to do in Miami, uh, Orlando, and uh, San Antonio? So, how has that transition been so far? I mean, you know, we John and I both know Coach Stockley was very focused on youth development. That's what the club, especially um, in the last well, it's only been one season, so in the last year, has really seemed to focus on. How do you see your role playing into the future development of players in Lexington? 
Yeah, I think primarily the role is obviously first team players, but part of that responsibility is, you know, can we integrate players smoothly? So when they're a U12, can they transition to the U13s, U14s and have a structure in place where, you know, the, there's there's information that filters down, if you like, to, to the players from the first team. Um, you know, the, the, youth, the youth club and, and the academy teams will have their own game model, but that will be reflective of the first team, not necessarily identical, but reflective of the first team. So, you know, to get that for the youth players, it filters down. So, for example, training sessions with the academy and now replicating some of the things we're doing at the first team, the behaviours that we want from, from young players that can then put them in a place where when they transition to the next step in their career, whether that's professional, whether that's college, they have those characteristics that can put them in, in, in a good place, in good standing, and hopefully be successful. Yeah, yeah um, you've really designed at least the first team that way by at least the media consensus of this very top uh, tier. Uh, I don't know if you you see the rankings or how people go out. I don't know if you're – are you – to that point, are you one that kind of pays attention to the outside noise, or are you more just zeroed in on your team and you focus on the day to day? Yeah, day to day, basically. I think as a coach, you can't listen to all the outside noises because it can distract you. So it's really important that yourself and your staff stay focused. Yeah, you're aware of things, and I think that's important. You need to be aware of, but you know, they're all sort of opinions, and 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 you know, not necessarily based on all the evidence, if that makes sense. So, you know, opinions are great. Um, but the, the beauty that we have as coaches is we're with the players every single day. So if we get distracted, the players get distracted and, and that's not going to be good for anybody. So the focus is dialed into the team, ready to go every day. Like we tell the players, you know, we can't ever guarantee you playing time and guarantee you success. But what we can guarantee you is we're here to make you better every day and you're going to get our full focus and attention for that. Um, and I think if you talk to some of the players right now, they, they would probably um, say that message is, is pretty clear. And, you know, when you see the guys in the building every day and, and, and what we've managed to change in terms of um, the setup, you know, we're, we're, we're on a process and a journey where we want to create a really good culture and an elite performance group. And then hopefully that can be reflected within our results as, as we move forward. But again, that's not going to, you can't guarantee results. And um, I would guarantee everybody in the league will improve. Um, you know, that's just the nature of the game and, and what happens within, within our sport. So everyone will improve. What we have to do is turn around um, last year's performances and, and improve at a higher rate than everybody else to, to then put ourselves back in the mix of, of, um, being a contender in this league. Yeah, so how, I don't know, for a lot of people out here, you know, in, that are not playing, paying close attention to everything, explain to us kind of what is your philosophy on approach to the game. We talked about the youth development, but like in-game, what are fans should be looking forward to seeing on the field? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we've got a, a team that, Obviously, we put together, um, we've got lots of variety within, within the team and different options. So for me, you know, what you're going to see every day is you, you're going to see players that work hard to the final whistle. We want that to be reflected with the community. So all the fans that come out and, you know, to spend their time supporting the team, we want to make sure it's reflective that these, boy, these players will go to the final whistle every game. So hard work in, in, in hard work is very simple to say, but to actually execute that for 90 minutes, that's going to be the demands and intensity we expect from the team. Um, and then from there, what, what do we do? Obviously, we, we have a plan going, you know, with the ball in possession um, and a plan for, for when we don't have the ball and out of possession. So we have those plans and we're working with the group and they've been doing really well so far, taking on board the information, um, you know, we prefer to have the ball than not, but we're comfortable when we don't have the ball as well. We just want to try and be in control of games um, in and out of possession. I think it's massively important, but ultimately we want to, you know, get on the front foot in games and um, play with a really good energy in games. 
um, and take take the game to the, to an opponent. That doesn't always happen. So then you have to be in control without the ball and and still put ourselves in a position to win games. So all of that is, is for me is a is kind of the characteristics of a style. The identity within that is, is, is for us trying to break lines and, and, and get forward and, and get players that are exciting, facing forward, facing the opponent's goal and, and, and being able to, to get at players and, and create goal-scoring chances. So when you're looking at the, the additions to the roster so far, who do you think is going to help you with that goal-scoring? Or is there somebody from the team from last year that you really are looking forward to lean on as the lead scorer for this year? I tell you what's been really good because we get to see the boys in, in, in training. But you know we've got different players that have um, characteristics that are exciting and it's good. So you know we'll we'll end up really just in simplistic form, two players for every position. But I'm excited by all that front six at the moment, and you know that that we're trying to get that combination correct is is going to be um, is going to be sort of. Take us time, I think, because you know the, the players are all going to be worthy of opportunities. So you know, you look at the returning three of the returning um, front three: uh, 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 Nico, Ortez, and, uh, and Khalid. Um, you know, all all look exciting, and then new players are like Azard, um, Nico, uh, sorry, Azard, David Luera, um, and Isaac Canu, the local boy, that is, is really impressed in the first couple of weeks of preseason. And then obviously Cameron Lancaster that everyone's familiar with. Um, you know he looks in a good run of form and in a good place right now too. Yeah, I was gonna say you got three guys now who have scored double-digit goals at the professional level. That's hard to balance. That's gonna be a hard thing to balance. So how is that pitch with the? You have twenty-four guys at least announced. I don't know who else you guys might pretty have. Much, we're pretty good for right now. Yeah. 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 Um, how do you balance that competitiveness with the guys? How do you get all of them to compete day in and day out? Yeah, I mean, look, at, at this point in time, they're all competing really well. And look, it's the opportunity. And we all know, um, you know, based on the experiences and, and, and being a head coach for many years, you know, everyone's going to be required this year. They're all going to have the moments. They're all going to have the opportunities. There are opportunities every day to, to show us um, what they're capable of doing and what they're capable of producing. So that's the phase we're in right now. Um, you know, the, the beauty of the group that we have, we can play, you know, with three, with two wingers um, and a striker. We can play with two underneath and a striker. We can play with two strikers and, and then four in midfield. So there's lots of variables um, that we have to look at as coaches, but also we can use it on game days. You know, if something's not working, you know, what we spoke to the players about is, you know, you, you need impact players on the bench um, because in this day and age, you can't just play 11 guys for 90 minutes. Having impact players on, on, on the bench and to go to during the course of the game, whether you change a system, whether you change slight style, because um, Kelly's characteristics are different to Cameron Lancaster's characteristics, um, but both have, have really good value to the team. So, what we what we need is impact players come you know coming off the bench because those guys you know we can be nil nil for 70 minutes and work the team and the team's worked us a little bit but then we've got guys that can certainly impact the game that can when it's all on the line the last 20 minutes may swing that in our favor so you know that's the role that those players have and that can you know obviously work in reverse with the defensive line where you know players come in to you know in baseball, like close out a game, um, you know, using a similar term for soccer, you're holding on to a one 0 lead, and you know you may may drop an extra defender in and, and a line of five, so they're impacting the game in a different way than maybe an attacking player would. So that's the most important thing for us is this is going to be a collective effort from the whole group. The group sticks together, and I'm sure everyone's going to have that moment this year that you know they they, they dream about, and um, you know hopefully. It's on, a, it's on a positive note with every single one of them and, and they all stay very healthy through every game and you know that's why I've told them all I want them healthy for 40 matches this year and that's not easy to do but we, we, we're trying and so far um, pre-season has gone well and, and we haven't picked up any new injuries. 
hey man, staying healthy at any level is, is a challenge, right? But especially when you get to this professional level, like it's not easy to stay healthy. So I agree. I think that depth that you're talking about is really important. And I think that's one of the things that you've really built so far this season. That's one of the things John and I are going to talk about later is this roster is deeper this year. Um, so with that depth, what are some of your expectations for this team? No, I think, again, for me, expectation of this team is, you know, we're ready to play every game and we're going to play for 90 minutes. And that's the expectation. Let's create this high-performance environment and the rest will take care of itself. We'll be ready for games. And when I say that, it's not only players, that's staff as well. Uh, that's that, that goes throughout everybody that's involved with the first-team players. We want to operate at a really high standard this year in terms of, you know, last year everybody did really, really well and, and, and got a club off the ground. And it, it, it's very similar to an experience had in San Antonio where, you know, that first year you you are flying the plane while you're building the plane. Now, mm-hmm. this year, um, you know, with the additional staff and, you know, the, the you know, everybody knows their roles and responsibilities and then that relates to the players. And so now can we really provide the player care um, to make sure we prepare the players so it leaves the players with, with no excuses going into games and, um, you know, leaving no stone unturned to, to solve problems. And I think if we can create that, you know, that's the goal for the year. And then what that looks like in terms of results, you know, obviously you want that to be super successful. But again, last year we, we, the, the team, you know, finished, um, you know, in, in ninth place. And, and, and at the end of the year, we, we didn't get a win in, in the, our last eight games. So we've got a lot to turn around. But everybody's working in a really positive direction. And, um, you know, we've tried to put a really good roster together with the staff and, and Sam and our analytic team. I think we've, we've got a good roster that has many um, players can play in various positions and various different systems. So that can give us different looks. So, you know, with the, with the league in USL 1, I think that's very, very important, especially with travel and, and you know, the different games that you, that you have and the challenges that you have that we can maybe look different from week one to week two to week three. Um, You know, and our job as as a staff is find those best players, find what that best formula is. And and if we don't get there till two or three months, hopefully we're we're working in a positive direction while we're trying to find find the best solutions for, for what can look like the best Lexington team. And the players will strive for that every single day. And everybody has that opportunity. And I think that's going to be a strength for the group. With the new league schedule, you have the chance of competing in three various different uh, tournaments with the Open Cup, the league, and then the new in-season cup. Is the staff's approach the same to the players and that type of thing? It's the same game? Just go out and play? Yeah, obviously you have to look at all the variables with with players and, and some workloads and some rest ratios for players. Um, that may be needed, but the, the mentality doesn't change. Um, I'm not, I don't believe in, uh, you know, you know, this is a cup game, this is a league game. No, this is our next game, and we focus on that. And whether that's the Open Cup, and I look at it with the potential to win four trophies. Obviously, the Open Cup is going to be very difficult with, with, <laughs> with the quality of the team, but we want a good run. You know, we want a good run. Yeah. So we want our fans to get excited. Um, we want our fans to 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 get. You know, maybe get on a couple of little road trips to some really exciting venues that are close by. You know, within you know, you get you draw a Louisville, you draw a Cincinnati. What a great experience for our fans! But we have to get to that point. So, so we we'll, we want to make sure we apply ourselves, and you can you can get upset in the cup like we know. Or there can be a free kick, a deflection, whatever. Anything can happen. But it's something we want to apply ourselves for for the cup. The league cup has never happened before, so. You know, to be the first name on a trophy, that's something that, you know, you can't be taken away. So it's something the players will strive to do. Again, every single one of those games, we'll attack it with what we think gives ourselves the best opportunity to to win that particular match. And then you have the regular, I actually, the regular season um, is a massive competition for me, but there's only 22 games this year. So the the margin of error is going to be a lot smaller for teams. And... You know, and then you go into the playoffs, obviously, and, and, and be the champion of the league, like NCFC were able to do last year. Um, and I think, you know, 
they didn't necessarily win the regular season, but they won the postseason. And, and, and you know, those four trophies were they attacking it every single week, the same way, the same mentality, um, with the same desire. Because I think as 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 a coach, as a player, as a fan, as an organisation, you know, that's what you want. You don't want to say, okay, we're going to rest players for this competition. Rest, no, not that's not how we're going to be. We're just going to attack every every game, every competition to the best of our capabilities. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the things that kind of that I wanted to talk about with you, coach. Like at the end of the season, I'm gonna be real honest. It was kind of disappointing, right? Like the team uh, with about what John eight, ten games to go was not far from out of the playoffs. And then, you know, some coaching changes, <clears throat> pardon me, um, some different movements and formations and some players switching in and out of starting and benching. The momentum really seemed to stall um, as the season ended last year. So how are you going to look to kind of recapture that magic from the beginning of the, the season where the fans were all excited, the team was really excited, playing in Lexington was a bit of a challenge for people. Um, so how are you going to look to recapture that and extend that over all 22 games, plus, like you mentioned, the Open Cup and potentially getting into the playoffs then? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that there's there's going to be a me- momentum um, all year is what we hope. And for me, it's getting to know fans as well, like, you know, doing the podcast with you guys and, and, and other groups along the way. It's, uh, you know, it, you want to get that message out. You know, we want this team to reflect the local community. We want this team, um, you know, that, that fans are very proud of. And that's what we've tried to put together. That's the responsibility um, that we have as coaches and, and as players coming in. So we want to create that excitement. And, you know, with, the you know, a new stadium on its way. I mean, you know, we, we train at the, the, the new complex every day. And every day I'm amazed uh, how different it looks and it, I can't imagine if I go away a week what it looks like um, but it really does look different and they're working extremely hard so you know that's something that will come and again that's a newness about it and you know if the team's in a good place when that newness is about it now we have a really good runway and good momentum going into the to the end of the season so hopefully we can have an end of season run um, our end of season's got it's kind of the, the fixture list is very tough um, you know, yes, the, the way when that's been put together, I, I, I'd love to talk to the league. It's not very kind, but at the same time, <laughs> you know, we want to establish that momentum for all the home games. So that really makes those home games a premium. And, you know, if they're in our own new venue, which, you know, we, we've had the, the, the luxury of seeing from our ownership, just the details of, of the stadium are, look amazing. And that's something that fans will be excited about. It will be a good night out. And, ho- you know, hopefully by that point, you'll be proud of your team already. So then now you can really get behind it towards the end of the season. I think we'll, we'll, be, we'll be massive. So there's lots to look forward to. Um, and, you know, I think being there on day one of a new season and seeing it build and seeing that momentum go, is, is a very special feeling for fans. So we want you to get behind the team. We've got those four competitions, as you mentioned, John, and uh, we'll be going for it in, in every single one. So just looking forward to, to getting started. You know, last week was exciting because we got to got to be back on the field, coaching the players and working with them. So that was super exciting. Um, and that excitement hasn't ceased. And, and when you watch the players and watch them train today and at the end, starting to come together and laugh and, and uh, smile, that's what we want to see. Uh, with the new stadium, uh, with it being in the heart of like the training facilities for the youth and that type of thing, how important do you think that is into that trickle down method? Because like famously, IX is similar, where the stadium is in the middle of all the youth training. I think it's massive, and and look, you know, we've used this before because in San Antonio we had the same, um, into Miami the same. And, and, you know, it's the simple conversations to the, to, to the young players. It's like, this is, you want to, this is where you're putting your hard work in now, but that's the building you want to be in. That sold-out building over there, it, it, can you perform in front of 18,000, 8,000, um, whatever the capacity of any stadium is? Um, and, and the players see it every day. Uh, and I think if I was a young player and, 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 you know, I had the opportunity to grow up in a professional club like I did, 
you know, it's inspiring. You know, when I was, you know, a young player, schoolboy, going into Nottingham Forest change, changing rooms, it was just like every day you get the goosebumps because you want to play. It's inspiring um, because you know Stuart Pearce may have sat here or, or whoever in the first team was sat here. And, you know, every day the players get to see that and I think that's massively important. And, again, that inspires the youth and, you know, both on the, on and in Lexington in particular, it's both on the boys and the girls' side, which I think is massive. How big would you say growing up in Nottingham during, I believe you said you grew up during like the glory days of Forest, right? Yeah, so I grew up as a as a youngster in the glory days, and yeah, they had and when I was in their academy, they were, Forest were very successful too. Yeah. So how would you say that influenced um, your philosophy as both as like from a player's perspective and then as a going into as a being a coach? I think it's very influential, uh, you know, because I looked at it and there was a clear pathway. You know, this is, you know, when I was growing up, you, you wanted to play for Forest, that was your hometown team or, or Notts County. And also went through that and I understand the process because Forest obviously deemed me not good enough at 16 and, and how how that can hurt people and, and send people in different directions because their dream is over or inspire you to go on and, and, and do different things and, and push yourself in different ways. And, you know, that was their meaningful moment. So understanding the academy and having those clear pathways was something when I came over to the States at 18 because my journey, 16 re released from Forest, and then I went actually to Knox County, um, which is... You know, if you ever see the pictures, it's like 400 metres away from centre circle to centre circle. But ended up going over to Knox County and was there from 16 to 18, where I met a gentleman by the name of Pat Barrett, who was then assistant coaching. He emigrated after year one to America, and then he brought me over at 18, because uh, that way I could continue my education as well as play. Um, and I was at a point in time where I could only play or do my education in England. So this seemed the best of both worlds at that time. And it was a time when it wasn't necessarily popular. You know, there was, there was no internet, there was no email. So it was, uh, it, it was a while back. I probably date myself there. But at the same time, um, it was an opportunity. And, you know, when I came over, those pathways weren't in place. And I was starting to coach and kind of navigate around that. I thought, you know, the one thing that was really important was a clear player pathway. Can you make it affordable and is it accessible? Um, so, you know, they're things that we're, we're working, you know, I've worked on throughout my career. You know, most players now have a pathway. You know, a, there's a lot of academies around the country now that are affordable because they're, they're not necessarily using the pay to play model. And, you know, and then finally it's the accessibility. You know, it, it's harder without a massive public transportation network and distance has been so big so it's trying to solve solve that so you can get to all the different communities in, in in every different city and continue to grow the sport that we all love and that literally could be a whole podcast episode itself right there coach like talking yeah. about that i mean john and i have talked about it i've had whole episodes of the show last season um talking about that kind of stuff but you know kind of briefly uh, and I know I don't want to keep you too much longer, Coach, but briefly, what is something that Lexington is doing to help bridge that gap? Yeah, I mean, look, within the academy, the, the, the scholarship funds as well for the affordability, but they, you know, they have now have a clear pathway, which is massive, um, which wasn't previously there. So, so now you know, that pathway is there. Now, obviously, you keep growing um, the product, so... You know, there's, there's, there's programs now where there's extra trainings and so on and so forth. So for the top talent of players in, in the area and, and, you know, these programs are growing. So now there's there's a place for these players all to aspire to. And, you know, the, the pool of players in Lexington is getting bigger. And once you get more and more players in the system, then more and more talent will come through the system. It will keep growing. And with the opportunities that, you know, especially you know Lexington is providing now with the with the facility and the coaches and and the programs in place. It is growing. I think that's what's being provided by the ownership right at this point in time. Absolutely. And, uh, one last question to wrap you up. Uh, how are you, uh, as a parent of two 
children that play at a high level. Uh, I believe your your daughter plays professionally with Hibernian, correct? Yeah, Hibernian in Scotland, yeah. yeah doing... I can never say that club's name right. <laughs> okay, hey, look, go we're from Kentucky, Coach. Don't judge us. <laughs> yeah, no, no, go with hips. Go with hips. You'll be all right with hips. Um, how do you – how is that pitch then – towards parents of say like the three trialists you had work out with the team how do you like are you able to connect with parents more that way since you have two kids that played at such a high level so. i think when you talk about it and and just know what the journey is and how hard the journey is it's not um everyone just thinks it's very like straightforward and you keep climbing mm -hmm. it's all it all goes in a, a lovely direction but there's so many twists and turns there's so many ups and downs and it's trying to manage and try and just keep okay keep the basic core values of what you want um in your own journey and my children are both um you know i'm super proud as a dad and i know uh, uh, and my wife are very proud parents but you know they have both different journeys different personalities different uh, been at different stages um a a along the way and i think that the most important thing is just you know you support supporting them and encouraging but at the same time um, just keeping, you know, try and keep like the emotions in in check because, you know, the the, the sport is emotional. It'll send your emotions all over the place because you have the highs and the lows. And it's just trying to keep that even keel. And then you go back to the core values of, you know, are you working hard? Train, practice hard. You know, not don't look for excuses. It's not somebody else's fault. Just focus on you getting better. And I think they're the the most important lessons as a parent. Um, and it's always tough because. You know, you, you, you do as a parent, you are obviously very emotionally attached and uh, you do go with the ups and downs with your children as well. But just to see them um, forge their own journeys is, you know, makes us, you know, super proud as parents. And, you know, they, they, you know we'll see where it leads and um, hopefully there's more ups and uh, the, the downs along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe you can even convince your daughter to come play for a slightly... Newer green team in America. <laughs> oh, that, that, would be, that would be a good story, but she's uh, she's definitely likes to be you know, like Naomi Pat Naomi Powell. So she she works works very hard and uh, yeah. So maybe one day, uh, and, and I'm sure she'll play back in the US at, at some point, um, maybe this year or maybe in future years. Maybe your uh, our friends over at Racing Louisville could sign them if if not Lexington. No, I think, I, I think hopefully if she, you know, at least I got, at least I'll have a roommate at the time. So if she comes here, <laughs> that's probably why she hey. won't. That's probably why she won't come. She knows. <laughs> hey, but saving money on rent. There you go. That's right. It'd be simple. Not, right? not much better than yeah. that. Coach, last question. You'll get you out of here on this. What? Do you what message do you want to deliver to the fans ahead of the, the start of the season? Again, Lexington opens up their season um, on March 9th against uh, North Carolina Hailstorm. Coach, what is your message to all the LSC fans? Now, first and foremost, look, just looking forward to meeting you and 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 see and getting to know you. I think that's massively important. It's a, it's going to be a collective effort, and we're going to need the fans to get behind the team. There will be road bumps along the way. That's inevitable, but we have to stick together and keep pushing the team forward. And the one thing that we'll make sure on the field is that the fans are very proud of all their players um, for the way they represent the city and the way that they do that from the first whistle to the very last whistle in every game. That's what we. That's what the message I would give the fans. And then let's stick together. Let's get to know one another and let's get behind this team and come up with a few good songs. I'm hey, that's your it. job, John. That's that's a real Working job. on it. We'll get you job. <laughs> you got to bear with me. <laughs> We've got to find a good song. Find a good song that's connected to to Kentucky, and we'll we'll, we'll sing it. Out. Get it going. We're trying. It's gonna. We're trying. It's getting collectively people to do that. Do that. The issue. <laughs> well, maybe maybe you get a few together, and I can pick pick one out for you for that, and do we're, that for the group. We're putting. We're oh, looking yes, Sam. at Sam's a better singer than I am, so maybe Sam. <laughs> Just we're do, do that. <laughs> Call up Dolly Parton or uh, no, that's yeah. Tennessee. Call uh, up uh, Tyler, Tyler Childers Chillers. or um, Jack Harlow. The, I'm sure Jack would do it, right? Jack's He's actually a Lou City fan. 
He's yeah. a loose city fan. We don't we don't want that purple. Yeah. 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 So Tyler Childress, come on over. Um hit us up on Instagram or Twitter. We'll make the connections. Because I know he's watching. <laughs> <laughs> all right coach we really appreciate you taking your time out tonight um as always fans make sure that you're following lexington sporting club on all social media sites and coach best of luck and we will see you out there on the pitch all right sounds good really appreciate you having me and um you know just keep doing a wonderful job and supporting soccer and anything i can do in the future just let me know sounds good thank you coach have a thank good you. one thank you thank you again and he goes out with fireworks. I liked that. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, man. John, that was a good interview, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very good. Yeah. Um, so now we'll kind of jump on into our uh, full kind of season um, preview here, John. Um, so as we're looking, I want to start by talking about some of the additions to um, Lexington Sporting Club. Um, so they've had several. Where you want to start? Well, I was just going to kind of go go down. I thought about going down the list. Um, I know a couple that I want to point out that I think are a little bit underrated. Um, so first yeah, so, one for me would be Mendez. Well, the center back. Uh, Modesto. Or Modesto. Yeah, yeah. Modesto Mendez, the center back from Cuba. Um, young guy, 25. Um has experience on the national level with Cuba in World Cup qualifiers, hoping um, to push that team uh, from the back to the World Cup. I mean, in 26, it's going to be a long shot for Cuba. But, hey, um, small countries have made it um, in several times, so best of luck to, to them. Well, I think it's an even lo- longer shot because I think CONCACAF only gets two slots. They do. They do. With the other three countries hosting it. Mm-hmm. Well, no, they could uh, have up for three, field. right? May, yeah, maybe. It's an expanded field. It's super weird. I'm um, pretty sure it's yeah, one guaranteed Mod- and then two play in. Yeah, we got Mod- we actually have two Cuban internationals with mm-hmm. uh, Mod- Modesto Mendez and Jorge Corde- Corrales. God, I can never say that name correctly. And he's uh, uh, he's back. a huge addition. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's a huge, huge addition. I think in general, the back, uh, everyone is focusing on our additions and the attack, specifically Cameron Lancaster, obviously. Um, with this move to Lexington, he's like writing his name as you could argue based on Kentucky sports history as like one of the better professional athletes in Kentucky history. I mm-hmm. Keyword professional people, pump your brakes. Yeah. You can throw your Louisville Cardinals and Kentucky Wildcats at me. They ain't professional yet. No, but I think that's that's a really good point, though. Like, because if you look at other professionals, I mean, there have been some really good people who have come in and pitched um, temporarily for like uh, Louisville Bats or even for um, the Legends. By the way, welcome back, Legends. Thank God. That's not official. Oh, shut up. It's, it's official. official as official. I can't wait to see Big L back on the field. I hated that counterclocks idea. Like that was horrible, awful, despicable, disgusting, etc. But um, when you're thinking about uh, some of the best people professionally in the state's history, as our commenter points out here, Muhammad Ali, of course, the professional. Um, however, you know, I do think Cat Lancaster is setting himself up to be in that conversation of best Kentucky professional athlete. Team. I would say he, he is the team. He, obviously, no one's going to touch Muhammad Ali. Um, he's arguably, by most measures, the greatest uh, boxer of all time. So that's going to be hard to trump. Um, but if Lancaster can capture like half of his Matt Blue City magic um, in in Lexington for a year or two. I don't know how long he's going to be in here, but he's 31 now. Uh, USL players typically don't last past their mid-30s. If they're playing past their mid-30s, it's kind of a miracle, at least in the USL. So if he is with us for a longer than a year, it's probably at max three. So if Lancaster can capture half of that, of what he did in Lou City, the man is 
a Kentucky legend, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, everyone's focusing on them when our back line has really gotten the upgrades with nothing outside of Pat, Pat Patty and Lou Young. We got nothing but like, cha- like USL championship MLS experience coming down per se to Lexington. Yeah. And, you know, Cano also coming over um, on the opposite end He's- of Lancaster, right? Well, yeah, he, Cano is a striker forward. Oh, I was talking about like on the age scale, like the opposite side. Oh no, I'm I was talking opposite end of the field. Oh, but Cano is actually a good thing of what Coach Powell was talking about of because uh, Cano is played at Dunbar, and there I know there's like two or three other kids in Lou City's academy that have also played at Dun Dunbar, which is a Lexington High School. Mm-hmm. So the factor is, I'm sorry to say this, Lou City fans, the factor of Lexington's academy existing is we're taking, which Dunbar has been state champions like three or four times running. They might have, the streak might have just ended this year or something like that. Uh, but they're they're a powerhouse in the state, and it's taking those kids from going an hour either down I. Uh, 96 or up by 75 and keeping them home at least for a small development period before maybe we sell them to Lou city where they make, make the jump or we sell them to FC Cincinnati. They're developing in their home instead of developing, you know, an hour North or an hour east, uh, West. And, and I did want to quickly kind of mention, yes, Michael, you are correct. They, they do, they did sign seven cornerbacks and a dream. Um, so hopefully that can help push them forward but i do have a a slight concern and coach uh talked about this a little bit he talked a lot about like the back line and like setting up the formation and stuff like that i wonder if we're going to start parking the bus like getting a one goal lead and then putting in like a fifth back linesman and just parking the bus no No? i didn't i didn't get that vibe from him i got a little bit of the vibe well, I got the vibe of there's so there's two ways to playing in my uh, experience. There's two ways to playing an attacking style, even when you're up. There is the where you play a balanced attack when you're up versus an all still like all gas, no breaks attack. Hey, hey that's that nice type style. of attack. But that attack um, makes you much more open and susceptible to counterattacks. Which USL team, USL one teams especially love to counterattack, and so if you're not prep prepared for that, that is how you blow a lead. Yep, and that is how you go from winning a game to either losing or drawing. So it's very. It sounds to me like Powell is wanting to be a high flying attacking team, but at the same time, taking care of the back line not wanting it to be a shootout, not wanting to solely rely on offense to get us through games, but saying if we get our one goal that we need, we can win. We don't have to go, all right, we need to get two because we're we're going to let one up type deal. Right. You know, it's that whole concept of, especially if you're up just one, you know, how much do you push versus how much do you defend, right? If it's late and we're in the 90th minute, you're up by one. Yeah. You're defending like crazy. Right. But if it's the, uh, 18th minute and you're up one nothing. You you can't just park the bus at that point and hope and pray for the rest of the match. Like Michael said, we may have seven center backs out there and a dream. <laughs> and but that's another thing, like that Powell touched on. This team is not even seven center backs. Mm-hmm. Yes, we have to, outside of maybe Icon and Fox per se. Even Fox probably could play up more. We really don't have any uh, backline defenders that, in my opinion, are like solely locked into a position where they can't come in and play a center back role or they can't play an outside back role or maybe may- play a CDM role. Like this team is very much built with versatility. Like as much as you've played up top last season, scoring thir- 13 goals, 13, I believe. Um, right. I'm not looking at the stats, but it seems right. 13 or 15. Um, 
as much as he played up top as in a center forward striker role, he is a natural midfielder. So, like, we have all these guys. Uh, Brown's a winger, can play on the wing. Uh, you know, we have Yankin who can play central mid or a cam role. And we have Caputo who, can, who probably will play a, defense, a central defensive mid uh, role, if I had to guess. But he can also distribute really well. Akon can distribute really well. Like, this whole team, it's the modern age of football where no one is locked into a team. So it's more building a team. And I think in general, it's building competitiveness. Whereas some guys last year were basically locked in starters and you might, they might come out for fitness. Like do you miss the game because he had a grunt, it's like angle injury, that type of thing where they might come out for fitness or that type of thing. Right. But the 11, 15 was kind of locked. Now I think it's far more competitive. There's no guarantees. Like, Yes, the youth was our leading goal scorer last year, but he's got Lizadi, Liadi, uh, he's got L'Oreal, he's got, you know, you could argue Kano, uh, he's got Lancaster, all Brown, he's got all these guys that could be challenging him for a role. So it's it's a whole iron chop and iron type deal. Like they have no there's no slacking. You mm-hmm. have to earn your role in this team, and that's what you need. Like I'm sorry, Lou City fans, when I saw this. Kano is not guaranteed minutes. Mm-mm. No, he's like, not. It, so much stuff I saw, I was like, good, he's going to get guaranteed minutes and all this type of stuff. I was like, do you see our forward group it's right now? He's not walking deep. in and being like, he's going to get minutes. Like I said, we have three guys who have scored 10-plus t- goals at the professional level. I believe Liadi scored 11 or 12 last year with Huntsville. I want to say the U actually scored 15, if I'm right. Lancaster has had 20 goal seasons. Yes, he's older and he's, you could argue, more broken down because of injuries. But it, if he's even like half that form, he's that's 10 goals. Right. So, like, you can't just walk in at 19 unless you're really good and just take that, take minutes from those guys. And I think that's the biggest thing. You have Onan, you can throw in, in there too. Like, it's a lot. It's going to be very competitive team, which, as long as it's like healthy competition, that's just, just going to make the team better on the field. Yeah. And, you know, I think, um, <coughs> Canute, like, I think him and Lancaster will probably do a lot of switching. I mean, that's what happened at Lou City. You know, they kind of went back and forth sometimes on who was playing and who, or who was starting and who would sub in. Uh, so I could easily see something like that continuing over with Lexington. But you're right. Uh, when you were talking a little bit ago about the youth, like he now no longer has to be the uh, goal scorer. He's got opportunities to distribute off um, to other players who can score as well as he's got players that can serve the ball into him to get uh, more goals like he did last year. Yeah, most definitely. And it's just, it's just how it happens and what makes us competitive. It's why Lexington is being favored in the preseason judgments and that type of thing. Um, and what I really liked was that coach is treating, it seems to be a fresh slate type coach. And by that, it's like, all right, yeah, we might have won, won that last game 5 0 or whatever. We might have rolled type Chattanooga. thing. All right, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We are OO now. Where we could, it could be like, I'm very much getting the vibes that like we could be undefeated, like just being a beast in July. And he's still like, we're OO. Like, we haven't won a game yet, fellas. Let's keep going, keep grinding. I specifically like that he focused on the Open Cup as much as like, um, because of the all the stuff that's happened, like we need coaches and stuff to be focused and prioritizing that thing. Like we geographically, it's looking like it's going to depend on the amateur or other D3 team we get, but then it's going to be Lou and it's going to be FC Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. 90% sure. Maybe throw Indy in there, maybe Nashville, depending on how the draw goes. But we have to get, win those games to get to those guys. Like, as 
different as the season's ended last year. The we took it to Lou City last year, mm-hmm. and I think it's very much that we're going to take it to them again. Yeah, that was something I, I meant to follow up with Coach on, but I, I didn't. You know, that match was really close. I mean, yes, the weather played a big in, uh, impact into that result, right? Because it was just 1-0 at the end. Um, so I really think, depending on how Lou City is looking, that could be an easy one for Lexington to go in and steal. They almost did it last year in their first season. And this roster is significantly more talented. And I think, and we'll get to this with uh, Lou City later on this month, I think Lou City's roster is down just a hair. That can be debatable. I got to still dig more into Lou City right now. Um, but yeah, it's going to be an interesting season for Lex. I don't want to pass... Uh, we still got to get through preseason. They've only been in preseason for a week, mm-hmm. which is very weird since championship teams have been in it for like two weeks, which yeah. I don't understand. But well, it the, is what it is. The seasons don't perfectly line up as well either. The it's a li- the championship season's a little longer, mm-hmm. but they start at the same time. Yeah, that's the only part of me. If you're starting at the same time, that doesn't make sense. That like. One would start two weeks before another one, but uh, you know it's gonna be interesting to see. Uh, we'll have a lot if first preseason game for Lexington is on sat- Saturday. They take on Columbus Crew two mm-hmm. uh, behind closed doors. Ninety percent sure it's gonna be in their weird practice facility they have up in Columbus. So we'll see if they live tweet it. But I'm sure they will. I mean, that's yeah, what Lou City's but, been doing, so I'm sure they would as well. Yeah. So we'll just have to see. And as um, you know, Coach Lou to it sounds like the team's kind of locked in and ready uh, with the 24 they got now. Uh, obviously, we might see some other guys come up. They did have three guys that trialed with the team, practiced with the team from the team from the academy. So we'll see. Um, but it's going to be very competitive. They're going to be a very competitive team. It's going to be very interesting how competitive they can be. Um, John, before we get into kind of talking about, you know, uh, predictions and all that kind of stuff, uh, I, I, there is one position that I still want to talk about. Um, goalkeeper. Emil Knight still coming back, right? He's going to be the starter for the team, right? Uh, it's, it's his to lose right now. Personally, I would say uh, we have a completely new coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Um, Causey did very well in his matches that he played last year. We bring in Nico Campes. Thank you. That's how his, uh, Camp Campoon Campions. Uh, I don't know how to say it. We bring Nico. in Nico from. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, other Nico, as he uh, said in a uh, Instagram story. Uh, with I do remember Nico, that. that was funny. Nico Brown was like introducing himself and he just walked in. And so he is now other Nico uh, as he placed himself. Um, comes from uh, Revolution 2 uh, with some experience and that type of thing. So it's going to be competitive. Um, it, you know, as much as uh, I appreciate, and I was glad Luke was there last year, a 17, 16, 17 year old compared to a 29 and 21 year old at the time uh, is a lot different. Uh, yeah. You know, Kazi is now entering, I believe his third professional season. You have Nico who's in, in his mid twenties, I believe he's 25. He's been there, done that. I'm all age 30 type thing. It's going to be competitive and that's what you want. You want all these competitions. Some, some fans aren't, aren't as excited about having competitions on the team or like it's a coin flip, but I much rather have that than anything. So we'll have to see that is Causey still the number two is Causey now number one. Like I still think Knight it's his to lose, but that where I have no idea where Nico ranks to the two. I don't know if Nico, uh, Nico was brought, I believe announced after we announced our new goalkeeping coach. I don't know if that's a guy he brought in to compete. Mm. with them so we'll have to see yeah that's a good one um and i'm quickly trying to like cut back through the news 
to see if I can establish when that information came out. Uh, remind me, who's the new goalkeeper coach? Uh, Chris Baracus. Chris Baracus. B A R Baracus. Thank you. Uh, so yes, he was announced Baracos. before the new coach was announced before bringing in um, Nico as a keeper. So maybe that is somebody that he brought with him. It could have been someone he brought brought with him. It could have been that's just like when they managed to finalize the deal. Like as much as people don't know, like some teams announcements for some time. I don't fully agree with that, but some teams will sit on announcements like I have a guy literally with them for three weeks and they haven't yet. It's not like required league hmm. to announce Who is that? official signings. What? Who is that? The the three somebody they've had for a couple weeks that they haven't Who? announced yet. Like Omaha. I know Omaha like had some guys in training that they hadn't yet but they're planning to announce. Like they just announced two guys today or hmm. yesterday. So like, like other teams do it. Lex seems to be on the Announce him, not like like Fuego announced some guy when he had played like three games for them last year, and I was like, oh yeah, this guy's on our team. Now. Oh yeah, I remember that. Like I believe it was after a game we mm-hmm. played too. It's like I, what? Tell him play. What do you mean he's now on your team? Like he's been on your team. Um, <laughs> so it's he's been you know, there for a while. We can see what happens. I don't know. I don't know if it was like when Chris got brought in. He's like, I want this guy. If he was to get a keeper deal, so we'll have to see. But it's all com- competitive, and that's yeah. what we want. That's what I want. Yeah, and, and I quickly just looked through like their the two news uh, releases that they had. I don't see any connection. Um, it seems like Coach was more at some of the Florida-based schools, um, while Nico was at. Um, Pittsburgh uh, for college, so uh, they may have crossed paths in a game or something like that, but I can't see a direct connection between the two. Um, if there is something that you all see, uh, you know, as any of the fans who are watching, if you see something, please feel free to put it in the chat here, um, and we'd be more than happy to to give you that shout out for that. But John, you were talking a couple of minutes ago about the upcoming schedule. Um, it is not going to be an easy one especially starting out that first home match against North Carolina Hailstorm March 9th Toyota Stadium 7 p.m. against who John how do you feel North Carolina Hail uh Northern Colorado dang it see I have this calculus folks you mean it's, it's part of it gutted I think that's been good too. oh have they um I'm feeling good about it. Yeah, they don't. They don't have Trevor. They don't have Rogers. They don't have Trevor Amon anymore. Like Jimmy, the the whole league has been flipped on its head. <laughs> Omaha has lost so Every many year. guys to the championship. Like the only teams, like I will say this: there's three. The three teams I think will miss the playoffs. Right or no, it's four. Um, I, I have three teams I, I think will miss the playoffs: Richmond, unless they can turn stuff around; Spokane and Fuego. Right now. Uh, Fuego has four guys announced at the moment. Uh, um, I know they have others because they've released training pictures, blurry ones, but they have other guys. They have more, more than four guys. Um, the kickers have not won since like mid June or July last year, still. Um, brought back a lot of guys, partially because a lot of guys play year there. And then Spokane's the new boys, so I had to place them. Um, so that'll be right. Very interesting to see what happens. Um, but outside of that, you're talking about it's an expanded playoff from six to eight teams, and last league games. Uh, you have the in season cup, which is going to be interesting how to keep that. We can already see that Powell's treating it just like every other game. So it'll be real interesting how it shakes up. We 
it's the hailstorm who are also gutted but they've also added some good pieces they brought back elgato which is a big deal um so it'll be very interesting to see how it goes. but we played hailstorm last year but we have a new coach um our t- team's completely different their team's completely different so there's like I'm telling you, fans right now, do not go into any of this exhibition with like previous last year's kind of standards or assumptions on the league. The only team that's like, I could say, is arguably going to still play their style is Knoxville because they brought back a lot and they've re- and they've just upgraded more and more on their uh, back line even more. They're still going to be a very defensive team, but that's really it in terms of play, like. Lexington's going to be a little different. We're, I think we're going to see a more conservative Northern Colorado. It's, it's going to be very interesting. Well, that makes me feel really positive then about the first six matches here, right? Because uh, at home for Northern Colorado, then again, following week at home for Chattanooga, then a short Which road trip down to Knoxville. as well. Eh, whatever. We'll see when the blue puppies ever develop no, we'll they, see they've, um, they've brought in a lot of veterans i'll believe it I'm when just, i see it i'm uh, just not saying uh they were they were in the final two years ago it's not like they're historically bad just saying do it in the playoffs um, and then that they like did. i mentioned short road trip down <laughs> down to knoxville <laughs> For the first of the uh, Battle of the Barrel competitions, uh, then returning home for Greenville, and then a trip down to South Georgia, and then a big one, the new kids on the block, uh, Spokane Velocity coming to Lexington on Sunday, April 14th. John, I think this team, Lexington, has a lot of potential to capitalize on this first month and a half of the season, more than that, the, before the break. Um, and jump out to a good lead because after that April 14th game, they don't play again until June the 1st. A league game. Yeah, a league game. Thank you. There was a, a big uh, difference there. A league game in, during that time. Yeah, they have a chance to jump out to a good lead, but it's going to... The thing is that we play the cup competition, which is just playing league opponents. Mm-hmm. In a similar sense, I I expect Madison and uh, like I expect Madison to treat us just as normal in that. The thing is, I don't with the in season cup. I have no idea if this little like most goals score incentive is really going to add anything to how each team plays. It might make them a little more desperate at times, but I don't yeah. see see them adding to how they change their playing style versus the league versus cup match against teams because these are all teams that know each other it's it's very interesting how they're doing this they're not but it's going to be teams we play in the league so it's not like we're playing chattanooga fc or we're playing Lu city or king's hammer or any other of these teams that we're playing team teams in our league mm-hmm. yeah and you know there's also going to be um what at least one, if not two, open cup matches in that first six games as well. Um, that'll two. kind of mess. Yeah, should be, should be. But depending on the draw, you know, like we talked about, with coach, if it's Lou City or Indy, they might have a better. We chance ain't getting them. Before. We're not getting them first round. Uh, these three teams are all entering in the first round of the open cup this year, so we're either gonna play another D three team or we're gonna play. Um an amateur bid team. I don't think there's an uh, amateur semi-pro. team going to be in the, in the area, a semi-pro team in the area that'll be there. The only the Tennessee we tempo. Get, we might close. get Chattanooga FC. We might get Chattanooga FC, or we might get South Carolina heat. Uh, oh, golly. So we'll just, <laughs> that'll we'll be see what we get. Um, Ask our friends down at uh, well, Tennessee tempo, how they feel about South Carolina heat. <laughs> uh, we'll see what we get, but that's who we're going to get. Uh, championship teams are going to enter in the second round. So we had to at least win to draw loose city. So maybe it'd be so, a fun uh, match with Knoxville. I would, I think that'd be fun. Knoxville or Chattanooga FC. That would be really good. That's who I'm hoping for. I don't, 
I don't think we're getting Knoxville. Or Ch- we might get Chattanooga FC. I don't see us getting Knoxville in the first round mm. of the Open Cup. Because there's other, like, it's going to be very interesting how the draw goes out. I think it, they'll be a, it, they'll try to not pair up leagues, like league opponents again. Because if we get Knoxville, that could be us playing Knoxville two times in the same week. Which isn't a bad thing. I mean, it's different leagues and you got to do what you got to do. I think it could be really interesting. Uh, and I would love to see like the the barrel competition have a little bit more stakes, right? Um, with the chance to move on in a tournament like the Open Cup. Yeah, but I see. I see them giving it to Chat. I see them pairing Chattanooga and Knoxville before they would pair like Lexington with one of them. So maybe there. I don't know. Is there somebody from Pennsylvania? We don't know. Ohio? We're waiting. We're waiting for Nisa. We're waiting for Nisa to figure themselves out. Oh dear God, <laughs> we're gonna be waiting a while. Uh, well, they have they have less they have like a week probably before they release it. So, oh, get on it, um, John. You know, middle of the schedule here. Um, June is two matches, both on the road at Forward Madison, and then a re- a return trip um, against the Velocity out in Spokane. And then in July through the beginning of August, four straight home matches hosting Omaha, South Georgia, Richmond, and then Charlotte. That is a critical junction in the season that they've got to pull away some good points. When does the new stadium open, actually? It's in August, right? It's last I heard it was set to open August first would be when they took okay. into it. And to So that August third game could be at the new stadium. Yes, it could be there. Um to then to some people's points, uh just a reminder that the stadium site you can't really see from the road. So mm-hmm. if you're saying there's no construction going on, as Coach Powell has said there is construction going on, you f- physically cannot see it from the road because it's like a hill if either if you're entering it you're going like up a hill so you're down the hill or you cannot see it at all from the interstate like you can maybe see the vehicles but you cannot see the physical site from the interstate it's not the big rock they're not putting it right next to the interstate it's like in i've just seen stuff but i was like oh they're not doing anything i was like how are we gonna open it in seven months i was like one Y'all underestimate truly how simple a stadium really is to build. They're not building this like state-of-the-art stadium type deal. It's putting in steel beams and bleacher stadiums I don't, or plastic seating that is all just lodged together. It's not that. It takes time to build, but it's not like super complicated to build. Uh, Michael pointing out here, thanks for responding there. Only one Pennsylvania uh, semi-professional team qualified. So, I don't know, maybe that's where they play us, or is there somebody from West Virginia? Uh, I don't know. I we'll would see. say if we would get that team, probably. Yeah. Hopefully it would be in Lexington. That would be good to host a game like, like that. But then, coin flip. where is it going to be? You know? Like, would it be at Georgetown? Georgetown? That they're yeah, going to play additional in... cost. What? Like an additional game that you know they would have to add to to the stadium. Yeah, but that's gonna, all the games we have are going to be in Georgetown until they move into the new stadium. That's the deal they have. It's okay. not like well, oh you got saying, it's not oh you got an extra game you got to figure out where to play. No, it's like we are <laughs> considered we have the stadium, especially in the spring. Like they there's like it's. I think the lacrosse team might use it, but they don't really. So, yeah. but they play like midweek, so it'll be interesting. But I think we'll have it. Plus, it's a coin flip to how the U.S. how the United States Soccer Federation picks who hosts. Literally, they flip a coin. I don't know if they literally do, or they put it like they do a system that says like pick, but it's not like like oh lower league or whatever. It's like they literally flip a coin. I hope they don't actually flip a coin. They go on Google and they do the Google flip coin. (laughs) I just think there's a lot more 
humor in that to me. Um, but John, the season for Lexington closes out with five home games at the new stadium. Um, August 3rd, as we mentioned, against Charlotte. August 24th, against Madison. Uh, September 14th, uh, they will have Knoxville in the new stadium. That'll be a really big one not to miss. Uh, September 18th, uh, Fuego comes to town. And then the final home game of the season, October 19th, two days after my birthday, against Charlotte Independent before they close the season uh, on the road at Chattanooga Red Wolves on October 26th. So, John, looking at the schedule at the back half of the year, do you think the new stadium and the competition that they're playing is going to be enough to help them sneak into the to the end of the playoffs? They're they are a playoff team. Wow! But Definitively, staying, John said they are a playoff team. You heard it here, folks. Jimmy, two thirds of the league makes the playoffs. All right, the. Right now, look at this thing. Are you saying there are four, five teams better than us? No, I'm not saying that there are five teams definitively better. Sorry, not five. But are there eight teams better? There would have to be eight teams better than us for us to not make the playoffs. I think it's close. I think they will sneak into the playoffs as the last seed in, maybe one above that. Um, if they make it, um, I don't. I mean, I you know Omaha me, John. Omaha has like been I'm, gutted. Car- North 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 Carolina is gone, <laughs> and Northern like, Colorado. <laughs> the top three chunk. If you look at the league table last year, top three chunk. It was like an eighteen point gap between three and four. Mm-hmm. Like it was a it was one through three gap four five six, and it was a lot tighter. And then it was a big gap to like Red uh, Fuego. Um, North Carolina is gone. Omaha and Hailstorm have both been gutted of their best players. Then you get into Charlotte, who has lost some guys, but they're still retooled. Greenville, who has lost some guys, they're still bringing in some people, but they're also retooled. Madison, who's probably going to be one of the better teams in the league. So it's if you're the top we are in the upper fourth of the league right now i'm not quite ready to jump there yet and you know i like to be super optimistic about all of our teams in kentucky i think lexington is solid what's holding you back in the table what's holding you back i'm such a results driven person man like the end of the season really affects how i'm seeing this team this year and i know it's a totally different coaching staff it's brand new players with a lot of new faces the entire league is different I, I get it, but I just I want to see it for myself. I want to see consistency, and I want to make sure that um, consistently the team is performing at a level to where they can get into the playoffs. Consistency is going to be king for this team. That's why I asked Coach about that. Like I want to see them push every game and treat every match like it is the biggest game of the season. Yeah, and if they're mid-table, they're playoffs. Um, our commenter here, Harry says Fuego, Spokane, Tormenta are not even close to Lexington. Mm. Spokane, Tormenta I'll agree. is really young. Tormenta, Tormenta hit the rebuild switch. Mm-hmm. The youth is the highest returning scorer to the league. Mm. Amon's gone. Uh, Olex is back, is up with North Carolina. Sterling sounds like he's going to be in Pittsburgh. He is like the highest scoring player left in the league. We are the only team that like truly returned our top two offensive players, like truly who were like in the upper echelon, like the top five players of their respective categories. We are like the only team. Northern Colorado's best person who's good was Billy King. That's who they brought back in terms of an attack. Hailstorm. They've brought in some guys, but they also lost their captain to Bohemian in Ireland. Like, there's a lot of these Bohemian? better teams have been. I love them. A lot of these guys have been gutted. 
Uh, Harry also pointing out that Richmond always underperforms. So it definitely seems like I might be in the the minority in the thinking here, but I think they're solid. I'm just picks. like if they finish I'm below mid table. I'm telling you right now, if you look, if you look at the league, mm-hmm. saying Lexington right now is might sneak into the playoffs is literally like disrespecting the roster. <laughs> Then make it happen, Lexington. Make make that take look as dumb as I am. <laughs> uh, just because, like I said, be consistent. Let's finish the season the the way that you start it, um, as close to the top as possible. <laughs> okay, Harry, now you're just messing with me at this point. Um, yes, I would take Lexington over the Sad Wolves, and yes, that is the new nickname for them. I will refer to them hey. always and forever as the Chattanooga Sad Wolves. Thank you. That is a nice you arrow need- in the quiver. You need to get on Twitter more. Sad mm-hmm. Wolves has been around for like seven months. Oh, oh, baby, you, I'm ready. You, you need you are so behind, Jimmy. Welcome to you my life, so, John. so behind. It's part of being 34 at this point. I'm just always behind it. I've learned. Anyways, things that we're not going to be behind on today is kind of wrapping things up. Um, John, final thoughts on Lexington. You're very positive on this year. What is your final message to all the Lexington fans? We're. I'm calling it. We're going to contend for the treble. Ooh, call the shot. We Mark should. it down. We should. The way Powell talked in this interview, we're going to contend for the treble. He apparent, especially takes a lot of pride in the shield, it seems like. So we're going to take the shield. We're going to probably, he's going to try to take the shield seriously. He's going to take the cup competition seriously. And then it's just a matter of the luck in the playoffs. So if not, we're going to go for the double. So absolutely. And he said he wants four trophies this year. So, hey, let's make it happen, Lexington. Three Um, of those are USL one specific. Mm -hmm. So So if you can get the three, you could probably get a fourth. Who knows? We'll see. The Open Cup's going to be hard. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you're all of a sudden not as optimistic, huh? An MLS side has won the Open Cup every year besides 1992. 7, 98, 99, like very early years of the MLS. Mm. And that was the Rochester Rhinos. Well, with MLS so, pitching such a fit to not even be a part of it, who knows? Especially in the early rounds. They're not. We have to get, we're not going to face an MLS side till at least the third round. So <laughs> we got to get there first. Absolutely. All right, everyone. We appreciate you all watching. Make sure that you are following us on all of our, or I'm sorry, listening to us on all of our podcasting platforms, Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio. we got the iHeartRadio logo pulled up right here for you. So you can scan that QR code or click the, the link down in the, the bio for that. Um, also, want to make sure that you, uh, you see the little QR code over my shoulder. It lives there every show. Uh, that's the support. Uh, support us with a Bias Coffee account. Um, any donation, we always appreciate it. It helps make the show better and better every single time. <laughs> I'm dying. I started the show as I'm ending it. Um, <coughs> oh, no. Uh, make sure you're listening to us on Spotify as well. Um, you can scan the QR code to get more information on that. Uh, but also, I'm literally dying, John. I'm sorry. Make sure you're following us on all our social media platforms at BG SoccerCast on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, uh, and YouTube. Um, and make sure when you're on YouTube, you're actually hitting the subscribe and you click the little bell icon to uh, to make sure that you get notified when we go live or when we post uh, updated videos. Um, with all of that out of the way, I'm going to stop coughing for the night. That's Mr. John. I'm Jimmy. And we will see you on the next one.